China has always expanded its territory whenever it, it was possible. And peace, world peace is the most important issue. We have to preserve that world peace at any cost. Any the British knew very well what was the position. They, they knew because they had been dealing uh, since uh, young husband in 1904. They had been dealing directly with the Tibetan government. Namaskar and Jai Hind. India-China relations are passing through extremely difficult times. The root of these tense times can be traced to the period between 1947 to 1949, as India and China emerged as independent sovereign nations with different forms of government. Tibet, which was inhabited by peaceful and spiritual people, was annexed militarily by China in 1950 50 and 51. So India, uh, so Tibet, which served as a buffer between in, in India and China, was no longer an independent and autonomous region. And with China at its door as a hostile neighbor and a government which believed that power flew always through the barrel of the gun, India was in a quandary. That is why the story of Tibet needs to be told and needs to be shared, the importance of Tibet. And who better than Claude R.P. to share his views, his stories on Tibet. Now, Tibet, uh, Claude calls himself a China watcher. I call him a Sinologist. And he's the author of Quadrilogy on India-Tibet Relations, 1947 to 1962. And this is one of his, the four volumes which I have. So welcome to Kashi Manthan Samvad, Claude. Thank you for inviting me. To begin with, the first question, what was the historical relationship between Tibet and China, which led China to proclaim as soon as uh, the People's Republic of China came into existence, that they will be liberating all Chinese territories, including Tibet? You see, if you look at the Great Wall of China, which is said to have started 7th century AD, uh, this Great Wall was the limit of the Middle Kingdom, the limit of China. But at the same time, I would say genetically, China has always expanded its territory whenever it, it was possible. And um, irredentism is, is the issue. It has been the issue for centuries, still the issue. If you allow me, I will quote from Dr. Asima Jundar, the great Indian historian. He wrote this in 1965. He said, it's characteristic of China that if a region once acknowledged her nominal sovereignty, even for a short period, she should regard it as a part of her empire forever and would automatically revive her claim over it, even after a thousand years, whenever there's a chance of enforcing it. So these words of Dr. Majundar are just explaining the whole thing, that China was weak, the Manchu uh, Empire collapsed in uh, to, uh, 1911, and after the, um, the power struggle uh, inside between Chiang Dai Chai, the nationalist and communist China, Mao Zedong won. He declared the People's Republic of China on October 1st, 1949. The week after, he started a campaign to annex Xinjiang. Xinjiang were the gate of Northern India, the gate of uh, uh, Ladakh, GNK state. Uh, he went up to Sh uh, Shaibula in uh, December of 1949. So he was at the gate of India. He was ready to take over the Aksachi. So first stage, he annexed uh, Xinjiang. Second one was, uh, of course, Tibet. F Mao Zedong was a great strategist. He was not, uh, unfortunately, India had dreamers and China as strategists. And um, I want a uh, second quote. Um, 
some American author wrote something which is very telling. He said, he who old Tibet dominates Himalayan Piemont. He who dominates the Himalayan Piemont threatens the Indian subcontinent. And he who threatens the Indian subcontinent may well have all of South Asia within its reach and within it all Asia. So Mao Zedong, by controlling Tibet, it was not a question of liberating Tibet. They could still today, they call it about liberation of Tibet. But by uh, occupying Tibet, he would uh, control the 10 larger rivers of Asia, which are their source in Tibet. He would control that Piemont. Now you just go to uh, today's Uttarakhand or Arunachal Pradesh, you see that um, the Indian terrain is very, very difficult to build infrastructure. That government has done a huge effort for infrastructure, but for years it was uh, maybe too difficult. And it's 1962 when China invaded. Now we're celebrating in inverted comma the uh, 60 years of 1962 conflict. But the terrain on India side was extremely difficult, while on the Tibetan side, the plateau was very, very. So Mao Zedong knew what he was doing. He took over Tibet. It was his um, ultimate objective to control Nepal. People speak about five fingers. I've never seen that quote. I've studied, I've looked into it for decades. Is uh, these five fingers, which would be uh, Nifa, uh, Sikkim, Bhutan, uh, Ladakh, and uh, Uttarakhand. I mean, today's Uttarakhand. Uh, I've not seen. I don't think he has ever said. But it's just speaking that these five fingers. So he would control the entire. And it's what happened in 1951-52. So unfortunately, the government didn't, uh, didn't re uh, react. And th that's uh, the tragedy. I must say also that Tibet had its own relation with China, but Tibet was a very weak state. The political system was extremely weak that um, ruled by reincarnation it's just enough if the Dalai Lama was at that time after 17th century who ruled of, over Tibet, where the temporal rule as well as the spiritual rule, rule uh, that if the Dalai Lama passed away at the age of 16, 17, or 18, and uh, there's uh, nobody there to rule. So it, it was left to regent who were corrupt. And uh, the China knew that in the 19th century, there was five Dalai Lama. Nobody, none of them reached the majority. So for one century, there was no uh, ruler in Tibet. It means that the Hamban, the representative of the emperor, had enormous power in Tibet and influence. So, but that's all. The, it doesn't prove that the Tibet belong, belong to, to China, but there had certainly a great influence in Tibet during that century because of that weakness of the um, ruled by reincarnations. Lord, you spoke of um, R.C. Majumdar and the American author of talking about the importance of Tibet and the Himalayan demon and of course the strategic importance and how China viewed uh, was a revisionist state to start off with. After independence, just after independence, there were two political thoughts in India. One led by Jawaharlal Nehru and uh, K.M. Panikar, ambassador of India in China, and the other by led by Sardar Patel. Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and Panikar were obsessed with peace with China and the overall picture of world peace. Whereas Sardar Patel thought more of the strategic importance of Tibet. So how did this political debate play out in India after China entered and started to annex Tibet? I think there was no debate in India because unfortunately Sadar Patel passed away very soon after. But uh, people do not realize that it was not really two schools of, I mean, it was, we can say two schools of uh, political thought, but um, from on Nehru's side, there was only his ambassador in China, uh, Sadar P.M. Panikar. Now, um, K.M. Panikar had been uh, ambassador to nationalist China in, uh, in Nanjing up to uh, 48. 
And at that time, he wrote something very interesting report that I quote in one of my book. And um, he saw the importance of Tibet. And he saw, he saw that India need to preserve that buffer and need to preserve that independence of Tibet. He saw also the attitude of China who would, whenever the possibility would come to uh, take over Tibet. Now, when the, he was reappointed, which is something uh, in the anal, diplomatic annal do not exist usually, but because he, uh, Nehru was very fond of him, he reappointed him in communist China in 1949. And <clears throat> immediately he taken the line of Nehru, peace, world peace is the most important issue. We have to preserve that world peace at any cost. Any cost, it means that even if we are surrendering uh, our border and Tibet, because you have to remember that at that time, India was fighting for the independence of the Asian nation, of the African nation. Um, for example, against France, I've done some studies also. Uh, Nehru was very, very uh, strong about uh, that France should leave, and it was he was correct in this, should leave uh, Algeria of Tunisia and later on uh, Indochina. But at the same time, if you look in 1948-49, only uh, de facto independence, independent country was Tibet. Tibet had its own government, its own flag, its own uh, stamps, its own uh, uh, passport. The, some of the Tibetan officials travel on the, on the Tibetan passport. So it had all the, in the, the sign of an independent country, which also include the, um, you, you can run your own foreign affairs. When it's a main sign of uh, an independent nation, when a nation can run its own foreign affairs. So there was a foreign bureau in, in, in Tibet and it, they were dealing with Delhi, with um, MEA, I mean, the Ministry of External Affairs and Commonwealth at that time, as well as a political officer in Sikkim who was monitoring the situation in the Himalaya. So till 1952, Tibet was fully independent. Now, uh, in 1950, October, uh, Tibet was invaded. And it's not Patel who uh, started, but it's uh, uh, Girja Shankar Bashpai, the Secretary General of the Ministry, who had been an old diplomat, uh, who had worked with Sir, Sir Olaf Caro, and who had been really uh, understanding the British way of diplomacy, of defending your own territory. He wrote that very prophetic letter that uh, Patel sent to Nehru on 7 November. And in these seven pages, Patel described the implication for India, for the border of India. The border of India has always been peaceful. There was no not a police, there was no ITBP, there was uh, no border post. People could freely go to Tibet and Tibetan could freely go to Bodh Gaya or Lumbini or I mean, Lumbini, Nepal or any, any uh, place in Northern India where there's a pilgrimage for Lord Buddha. So that was going on and suddenly, Tibet is invaded. So Patel took the letter from Bashpai and uh, in the cabinet of Nehru, uh, most of the minister understood the situation, including uh, Rajendra Prasad, the president, who had been just elected president on 26th of, uh, of January. So, and including uh, Shyama Prasabuk Mukherjee, who had to leave the cabinet because of difference with Nehru over the happening in um, East Pakistan. So um, they all took a very strong stand to uh, tell Nehru about this implication for India. But Nehru didn't listen. And the great tra tragedy that Sadar Patel passed away on December 15 of um, 1950. So hardly two months after the Chinese had come into Tibet and after one month after he had written that prophetic letter to Nehru. So I have written a small booklet that I just kept for me. It's called the Karma of Tibet. But uh, this was really something uh, that uh, out of the blue. And uh, the fact that there, Sadar Patel, Deputy Prime Minister passed away 
I think the other leaders didn't have the courage to stand to Nehru. So at the end of his letter, Patel asked for a cabinet meeting to discuss that issue and to see the implications for India. That meet, meet, meeting never took place and Nehru uh, imposed his policy of friendship at any cost with China to avoid, I mean, objective for good, to avoid a world war, but uh, by this, uh, 70 years later, we have uh, several lack of Javan and officer on the border, including the confrontation of Ladakh where 60,000 uh, Indian are facing the, the Chinese. So sometimes some decision like that have immense uh, implication that we see on, on the later. And um, I want to say also that Patel, he was not well at the end of November already, and uh, but he created a committee which is called the um, Imatsingji Committee. Imatsingji was a deputy uh, RM, um, Defense Minister of India. And um, it was a multidisciplinary committee with people from Air Force, from intelligence, from MEA, from Army. And they were to look after the northern and the northeastern border of India. And one of the uh, main decision of this committee was to take Tawang that the British had put on the map south of the Mount Mount line, but they never uh, look after the administration of Tawang because the British were basically traders. They were not interested in, uh, in spending money on these uh, remote areas. So because of the Imachinji committee, the uh, Bob Ketting, uh, with the governor of Assam, Dolatram, they uh, sent an expedition with 300 Assam rifles and without shooting. So th that's, uh, I think it was a large majority in the cabinet who uh, took that decision. Uh, a small story if I have time. Um, one of my book, I think the second book was released by uh, Ambassador Bashpai, the son of uh, uh, Girja Shankar Bajpai, and he told me the story that the day after Patel sent that letter to Nehru, um, um, Bajpai, while he was entering his office in South Block, uh, Nehru's office was next door, and he was caught by Prime Minister, and he said, uh, Bajpai, you're marshalling the big shots against me on Tibet. And uh, he meant that uh, all these uh, senior leaders, Rajaji, KM Munshi, Rajendra Pasad, uh, I mean, not Shama Pasad Mukherjee because he had left the party, but they were all uh, pushing for doing something, but it didn't happen what to do. It's a tragedy. So while we were obsessed with peace with China, Xinhua in August 1950 circulated a message where they said that they'll be liberating Tibet very soon. Uh, there, are, there is correspondence between Mao and, and the PLA where they talk of liberating Shamdo in Eastern Tibet. On the other hand, uh, Kiem Panikar, he, after meeting Chao Wanlai, he said that there was no threat of military invasion of Tibet. But not everybody said that. P.O. Harishwar Dayal said, warned India of, of a building threat. There were others also who were speaking on the same lines. So where did we go wrong, Lord? I think you have to start a little bit earlier. And on December uh, 31st of 1949, India decided to recognize communist China. It was a second state a day or two before uh, Burma, Myanmar had recognized China. Uh, Sadar Patel also asked Nehru, he wrote to him a letter. He said, why, what is the hurry? What, tell me what is the hurry to recognize? We don't know uh, about uh, that regime. Actually, they had already come to, uh, to the border. Maybe they didn't know, but uh, they had closed down already the Indian Consulate General in Kashgar. And uh, the Indian Consulate General had to walk from Kashgar to Leh one month via the Karakoram Road to escape the, the Chinese. So anyway, 31st December, 49, uh, India recognized communist China. The next morning for the new year on January 1st, it was announced what you just mentioned, uh, we, which was reiterated in uh, August, that uh, the Formosa, the island of Hainan, 
and Tibet would be liberated in 1950. So it was a uh, plan. It was not something which came out of uh, the blue. Uh, actually, there are records, uh, Russian archives showing that Mao Zedong at that time was in, uh, for a couple of months, was in the uh, Soviet Union, and he had met uh, Stalin, and Stalin somehow gave the green light to go ahead in Tibet. And uh, even he promised some uh, support for it. So uh, Mao had the green light, and uh, he, he went ahead. Uh, Panikar was, he, he was a changed man, I mentioned it, uh, between his first tenure in Nanjing and the second in Peking. Uh, he used to be received at night at one o'clock, two o'clock at night by Chuan Lai. Uh, he was very well received. I would not add more to, to that. Uh, I was told by a diplomat who were there, who had been working with Panikar. Uh, he was too well received, and somehow he was convinced in the middle of the night by uh, several meetings like that, dining with uh, Chuen Lai, that uh, in, nothing will happen, that uh, what you mentioned, that uh, China would not invade and they would discuss with the Tibetans. And they would. Now, Mao Zedong, as I mentioned, he was a great strategist. He planned the action in two stages. First stage, military stage. Tibet had a very weak army. There were four or 5,000 uh, troops, but these troops were not well trained. Uh, there are no real commanders. Uh, each, like we could uh, see, uh, commanding officer with three or 400 men was uh, working completely independently. Uh, the governor of the Tibetan governor of Kham. Uh, Nabo Nawang Jingme, at one point, uh, he was offered uh, to put uh, wireless sets to all these different posts. He said, no, it's not necessary. So there was no uh, unified and effort to defend Tibet, and they had not the capacity, the strategic capacity. While Mao, had, after the long march, has had the strategic capacity. As a result, uh, Chamdo fell in one week. The, um, they crossed. Um, the, young, the upper Yangtze uh, on the 7th of October, 1950. By 17th of uh, October, Chamdo had fallen. The governor was taken prisoner and taken to uh, Beijing. Now, it is uh, the prisoner of war, Nabo, the governor of, West, of Eastern Tibet of Kham, who was the chief negotiator for the second part, the second stage of Mao's campaign, which was a diplomatic campaign and to force on the Tibetan uh, an agreement. It resulted in a, a 17 points agreement. And the first article said that now Tibet has come back to the motherland. To come back to the motherland means that Tibet was not in the motherland before. And, but they promised in this 17 point agreement that nothing would be changed of the role and the stature of the Dalai Lama as well as the Panchem Lama. Like many times, and uh, we are seeing it today in the dark, I mean, since 2020, China signs agreement, but they do not respect agreement. And that 17 point agreement was never respected. Soon after they reached Lhasa, once the agreement was signed in, in May of 1951, on 23rd May, and uh, they reached Lhasa in September, the PLA. Uh, first 10,000 and after 20,000 troops reached Lhasa. Each, immediately they start changing the, uh, the, the rule of the game, and what, what, uh, whatever they had signed and whatever they had agreed. And I must say that Dalai Lama has always said it was uh, agreement signed under duress in the sense that the Chinese um, forged the seals of the, the thing. Whatever, once in, in Tibet, they start behaving like it was uh, always their country. And uh, when something quite tragic for India, India uh, decided to feed the PLA because 20,000 people who arrived in, in a place like Tibet we never known about starvation for century. Suddenly, uh, 20,000 uh, mouths to feed. It was not uh, sustainable. There was not enough food. First, they emptied the granary. And after that, there was not enough food. So uh, the government of China 
asked Nehru, please uh, help us. And tons and tons of rice were um, transferred via mules, uh, via Jalepla or uh, Natula to the Chumbi Valley and for the in, in, uh, Chinese troops, the PLA troops. So <laughs> what to say, what to do, it, 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 it was done. Um, I think, as you say, the people on the ground, whether it's uh, Arish Fardayal was a very, very brilliant IS, ICS officer who was posted in uh, Gantok in Sikkim, and he later he became ambassador in Nepal, or uh, Shumul Sina, the, uh, the head of the mission in Lhasa. Till 52, there was a full-fledged Indian mission, like an embassy. Mm -hmm. And it was downgraded, downgraded by Panikar just uh, one or two months before he left on transfer to Cairo. So he said, it's the best thing I've done, but it's something which was not, the parliament was not informed, the press was not informed, nobody knew on, in India. It's only now that we have access to the archive, the, particularly in Nehru paper that we discovered this. Mm -hmm. So the downgraded of, downgrading of the um, mission in Lhasa into a consular general means that Tibet had de facto lost, lost its independence. So one of the officers, Krishnatri, Major Krishnatri, who was posted as an Indian trade agent in Gyanse, one time he was discussing with Arish Vardayal, and Arish Vardayal said now that uh, um, we have lost uh, Sadar Patel, and uh, now we are at the mercy of the visionaries. So it means the visionaries were Nehru and Panikar. And uh, the grand reality was totally forgotten. And uh, Shumul Sina, the head of the mission was recalled. He was very badly treated. There's a couple of letters from the prime minister speaking very poorly of him. Uh, telling him you don't understand the larger implication. That was Nehru's favorite term, you don't understand the larger implications. But um, I think they understood very well. And I, he, Nehru said he was right, call him back. And, and he, he, he refused to call, come back to Shumul Sina. He was dejected man because he had been very badly treated as well as Arish Fardayal. So it happened to all the people posted on the ground because they wanted to show another view that it was not like that. And people really admire these people who have been posted in Tibet. They're mostly from uh, army background and uh, Major S.L. Chiber who was there in 59 when the riots took place and Krishna Tree and Casey Jaure, and I have tried to interview many of these, now they've all gone, but um, that was quite remarkable people when, who provided the proper information to the government to decide. Uh, Claude, the British had left India very recently when all this was happening and they perfectly knew uh, Tibet's legal position. And we know that Dalai Lama made an appeal to the UN when the Chinese invaded Tibet. What was Indian, what was the Indian and British position on this Tibetan appeal? The British knew very well what was the position. They, they knew because they had been dealing uh, since uh, young husband in 1904. They had been dealing directly with the Tibetan government, especially in the 30s and the 40s. They had their own representative there, Mr. Richardson, who became later on between 47 and 1950, the Indian representative, because there was nobody uh, with that knowledge in India to represent uh, India. So uh, they knew very well. But when the issue came in the UN, on November uh, 7 of uh, 1950, the Dalai Lama sent the um, appeal to the UN. Now, the first question, does, uh, they said this appeal doesn't come from Tibet, because it had been cabled from Kalimpong. At that time, the Dalai Lama's representative was in Kalimpong, so this is not valid uh, appeal. So finally, they managed to, uh, the, to convince the UN. Um, it was the um, General Assembly had done a special committee, and they managed to convince that it was okay. Now they say, but Tibet is not a country. And um, for the British, it was a country because in 1943, when the 
Chinese foreign minister ask the British government, what is the status of Tibet? They had sent a letter, uh, Anthony Hedden, the prime minister of uh, UK had sent a letter saying it's a de facto independent country. Now in July of 1949, again, uh, the um, uh, question was asked in the British parliament, what is the st status of Tibet? They say we stand by the 1943 letter from Anthony Hedden to the, uh, Dr. Song, the Chinese uh, foreign minister. So they knew very well. Now the British uh, was in a country, they said, okay, we, Tibet is an independent. Therefore, according to the rule of the UN, we have to defend that country. Nobody wanted to defend. And India was uh, the least wanted to defend Tibet militarily. So they decided to change their uh, legal position. And they, there was correspondence between uh, New York and London. And they said, you change the legal position. They say, Tibet's uh, uh, status is very vague. We don't know, nobody knows exactly. And it became also the Indian position. Now, when it came at the end of uh, November 19, uh, 1950, the discussion came, the Indian ambassador said, we will sort out the problem with China. We are good friends with China. We will, we will sort out the issue. In the meantime, Nehru had sent all the long, long letter to his uh, um, representative in New York. And he had said, Tibet has full autonomy, verging independence. but." Again, uh, the government didn't want to take any uh, countermeasure or to do anything militarily to defend Tibet. So they told the UN, okay, we will sort out the issue with China. They are our good friend. Now, a few years ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago, one Canadian scholar did some research in the files in the UN, and she found that the issue is still pending. <laughs> but she called uh, that uh, report the mistake of the century because she argues, she was a lawyer, she argues that first Tibet was an independent country. This thing of Kalimpong was nonsense. But uh, because of India saying that we will sort out the issue amicably with China, it, uh, they put it uh, um, pending. So it's still pending, but nobody or today will take uh, issue to the UN. You see, at that time, Costa Rica was a tiny country, fought for Tibet, but, and the US didn't do anything. So that is a situation today. And uh, though uh, the UN passed a resolution in 1959, in 1961 and 65, another resolution, and only the 1961 India uh, voted in favor and uh, Sakarya, the Indian representative, gave a very strong speech. And uh, of course, it was at the time of the tension with Pakistan. So at that time, Lal Badu Shastri was very uh, powerful, very in favor of recognizing the government of the Dalai Lama in exile. He called the Dalai Lama's representative. He told him, when I come back from Tashkent, I will recognize your, go your government in exile. So again, it is a karma of Tibet. Again, he never came back to Tashkent and the government in Dharamsala has never been recognized. So what do these things which are beyond uh, human comprehension sometimes, but it, is, uh, it has happened like that. Hopefully now something will happen that will change that uh, narrative. The Chinese claim that they liberated Tibet peacefully. And Tibetans are known to be peaceful and spiritual people. So did this so-called liberation, which we call annexation, happen peacefully? Or did the Tibetans put up stiff resistance? They put up stiff resistance in Lhasa uh, between the 10th of March, 1959, and the 19th of March. But they were totally smashed. Several thousand people. Uh, were killed. Now, I was very lucky, you know, as a researcher, when you find some file, special file, it uh, brings the joy that you have been looking, digging and digging for years, and suddenly you find something. I found the report of uh, Major S.L. Chibber, the Indian Consul General in Lhasa, and he described in detail. So we have a record of what has happened. When China said they have emancipated the serfs during that week, and that they've liberated, that was a real liberation of Tibet. And still they are celebrating um, 28 March 
1959, they have been celebrating as the emancipation of the Serbs. Uh, the report of uh, Major Chiber proved that it was uh, very, very violent. The Tibetan fought very well, but they didn't have any uh, equipment, any uh, ammunition, and the uh, government of India didn't want to supply. Nobody wanted to supply. So they fought well, but they were, they were totally smashed. And the uh, Dalai Lama in, on 17 means between that, uh, when the war was going on in Lhasa, escaped and he took the direction of India, of um, Tawang, and he entered in India on the uh, 31st March 1959. And there was a message from the prime minister say that you're a welcome guest in India, we will look after you. And uh, it's what uh, India did. They look after the refugees, but never took a political stand for, uh, for Tibet. But they really look after well of, 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 after the uh, younger generation of Tibetan who has been educated. I'm sure that you have in BHU. And so this part they did, but the political aspect they never respected. They were never. Uh, so now it's very difficult for the government to change in one day this. But one day something will have to be, at least the narrative will have to be changed. The correct um, historical perspective would have to be given. Tibet, I'm sure, Claude, is a very complex story, but the story needs to be told. And I don't think we, we can cover the whole story in, in one episode of conversation with you, of Sambad with you. So I think as, as we were discussing, I thought that it would be good if we can have two more parts on this. One covering the period from annexation of Tibet till the 1962 Indochina war and the other, the present day story of Tibet. So it would be good if we have with you, with us, the whole conversation, the whole story so that the people know and with that, I would like to thank you. Thank you for sparing time and, and telling us such a wonderful story, a wonderful, tragic story, I would say, because Tibet, Tibet. Yes, tragic, tragic. Needs tragic for uh, Tibet and tragic for India. Tragic for India, because look at where, I mean, Ladakh is more uh, uh, adjacent to Xinjiang, but it's uh, still. So as we said at the start, the, the roots of the problem today lie in the past. Thank you so much. And uh, we would soon be having the second and the third part of this conversation. Thank you and Jai Hind. Jai Hind.